Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Strecce, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to KubeCon Europe. We're here in sunny Amsterdam. It is a glorious spring day, and I am so excited to be kicking off this show here. I am joined by Yoop. Yoop, this is our first time co-hosting together. How are you it doing is. this morning? I am very well. I'm enjoying the natural light here. I'm enjoying the ambiance. It's, it's awesome. It's a whole vibe, and as it you is. told me, you've never looked more beautiful. I'm sure the audience agrees. Speaking of beauty, we've got a fabulous first guest to start off the day. Sebastian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So, before I say where you work, everyone's been talking about your car. Yeah. How did you get to the show? Tell us about that first. Well, I drove from Ingolstadt to Amsterdam with an e-tron GTRS, 650 horsepower, um, three engines, 3.3 seconds from zero to 100, which definitely is very dangerous in, in the Netherlands. <laughs> it was fun driving here um, <laughs> until, until I reached the border yeah. to I'm, the yeah. Netherlands. Then fun stopped immediately. <laughs> when the three hashes stopped, it was over. Yeah, yeah just like, it's like, um, <laughs> You can drive 200, 250, 260 was my max speed because um, I'm a responsible driver, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, th there was very low traffic at some at some points in Germany. Yeah, so you had all these three or four lanes for yourself. You can you can do that. But in the Netherlands, it's like 100 max, right? Until yeah. seven o'clock in the m in the night, and then you can drive 120. Really? I don't think I, I do that. I've, I've, I've seen that. It's, it's like um, from 6 to 7. Yeah. Um, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. You can drive 100. And after that, 120. So one, 120 You get a little naughty after dark. Speed. Like, what is that? That's so great. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's like um, in four seconds, um, you're definitely a speeder here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, if you haven't guessed, our guest it works for Audi. Tell us a little bit about your role there and what's up. I'm team lead of the Container Competence Center and Platforms team. So we have um, several responsibilities. We create new platforms together with other teams. We maintain our own platform. And we have a cultural mission of oh. transformation. And we have a transformational force with an enablement awesome. layer throughout the silos. And um, wow, that's so critical. We do uh, container security as a service throughout platforms as well. So it's quite a big team now, and we've started this uh, four years ago, just three people, and now it's three product teams actually. Wow. So what I want to wow. know is, you're you're in this competence center. You're kind of centralized. You're uniquely positioned to help the whole organization, you know, adopt Kubernetes, adopt cloud native. But how does it work in an organization of this size? Because Audi is not a small company. Great question. So I wonder, how do you do it? How do you make Kubernetes a success in an organization like this? What's your, what's your plan of attack? Well, um, I focus always on adaption. So you need to convince with a great product first. And it's not like uh, there is a top-down decision process first, uh, you choose the tech, yeah. and then you tell the people what to do. What we do is we gather the most passionate people. Um, we do people first transformation and let them choose the best tech to solve a problem. Yes. And if Love you do that. people first transformation, you people solve problems. If you do process first transformation, people satisfy processes. Yeah. Yeah. And louder for the people in the back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And because I, I was going to say, I hear you know people first. I hear let them choose the technology. Yeah. And I didn't hear process up until then, um, which I think is, you know, a a great thing, uh, but b also not something you would expect from a company this size. From German exactly. engineering, no exactly. Less. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The process comes at a certain point, and it needs to come. It's it's mandatory. It's necessary. We can't live without the process. Yeah. So um, uh, it's also not scalable throughout the organization without processes. Uh, you can't handle uh, the six thousand six hundred Audi projects. Um, that's so many projects you're working that's, on. That's so many workloads that, that uh, Audi manages. And that's just Audi. Right. We are in a, a part of the VW group. Mm -hmm. So right. 
in a, in a wider sense, uh, it's uh, the scalability is necessary throughout Audi, VW, Porsche, or the premium group with the other premium car manufacturers in, in the VW group. So we always have a responsibility of thinking um, with a scalability to other brands as well, even out of our own borders. But um, let alone Audi, um, you can't have 6,600 DevOps teams with 6,600 um, just the thought is overwhelming security experts, and the, there's nobody for that on the market. So yeah, um, you need platforms, you need processes, you need to centralize that. And what we promote is something you haven't heard in the DevSecOps or in the DevOps culture uh, a lot. It's respect the silo, don't fight the silos. Leverage the silos. I have never heard that. It's, wow. it's our yeah. way <laughs> of scaling um, an organization. But what you can do when you, um, when you ask why you're doing DevSecOps, you have some business goals behind it. You can right. reach those business goals without investing 80% of your energy in fighting silos. So, so let's dive yeah, into let, that. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, we got to go deeper on that. So culturally, I mean, first of all, that's awesome because it's, it's almost contrarian in an ironic sense. But how, how do you then, if you're not going to fight the silo, how do you embrace the silo? What does that look like from a company culture? You have specialists, obviously, uh, in a certain field. We have a product team for container security. So every container or every workload, every application project team doesn't need their security expert in container technologies. Um, that's the kind of platform thought everybody has, right? Mm -hmm. So you um, have a centralized service for everyone and that everyone can leverage and that everyone can learn from as well. So we started off with um, getting the most passionate people together to create something great, right? So you have a great product first. But you also need passionate people to create products. Yeah. Um, so when you when you reach the point where you uh, let people choose the technology for solving a problem, and you automate that, what is the automation? It's a process. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The automation of the technology they've adapted to 100% degree is a process itself, and it's a process that naturally evolved. Um, and already is proven to solve a problem. Not something somebody invented that caused even more problems, maybe, sometimes. Right. Yeah, sometimes it is like that, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and that way, you can automate through the silos. So you have a developer on the left, you have a infrastructure on the right. Mm -hmm. So how does the developer get stuff to the infrastructure? It's usually a service owner in the middle. So right. often it's an external development company, a service owner in the middle who organizes the external uh, company and then internally has to organize operations. And he's like overwhelmed because he's not really too deep into the technology. Mostly they're users themselves mm -hmm. of the application. So it's a technical developer of autonomous driving, for example, who's like working on the car itself. Right. So he needs a software to do some uh, math on, on some equations and needs to calculate it fast with some machine learning, yeah. uh, accelerate the process uh, to simulate millions of kilometers driven on a certain part. And he outsources that to an external development company. Then he gets the results, um, but this external development company needs operations internally because the data belongs to us, obviously. Yeah. And then uh, how do we do that? Uh, we let the external company or the internal development company, which are companies yeah. of ourselves, um, we let them automate through uh, the, 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 for example, OpenShift mm -hmm. um, platform to our infrastructure, to the Kubernetes endpoint. So after the Kubernetes endpoint, everything is with us. And we show them how to do that, how to create a container on OpenShift, um, no root, for example, first rule, and how to create a Kubernetes manifest so they can deploy seamlessly and automatically to our platform. And we give them a couple of services so they can do that securely. And we focus just on security and runtime, and everything else is with the DevSecOps team. Right. And they have a vertical of managed services as well. 
so they can mm -hmm. tap into cloud native services. We don't resell Azure, Google or AWS services. Uh, we just say you can get a cloud account and you can connect your container with a vertical of cloud native services uh, yourself. So it's a mix between um, you're responsible for your own cloud account and for the services out there, but your runtime and your security is with us. We focus on the interface security and the runtime. So I, I like that approach because this almost, you know, this obviously feels like a startup within Audi. It is. Yeah, um, it totally does. But at the same time, there is a little bit of friction because Audi is a big company, there's a lot of people involved. You cannot let everyone do their own thing completely. Yeah. And so I like your focus on offering a standard runtime, a standard set of security practices. You know, you've, you've standardized that, you offer make it that fast as a and service. Make it safe. Yep. Exactly, and that's, you know, that's kind of the de facto definition of what platform engineering is supposed to be. But you also very explicitly say, hey, here's, here's the freedom that you do have, because there's a lot of things that you need to do that don't necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily care about. We care that it's safe and fast, and you, know, you can deploy it to production. But then here's all of this freedom that you have to actually let teams innovate. And I think that's a very nice balance between you know, being in a big company, but also being that startup within the company. Yeah. Um, so what I wonder is, is how do you make, how do you onboard teams onto a platform like this, given that they're you know, maybe used to a lot of freedom, but now they, they do have to use a couple of your standards. How does that work in terms of user adoption? How do you make them smile and be happy about the services that you offer? Yeah, you have to keep in mind we have all flavors of product teams. People who have literally um, no idea, haven't ever worked with these kind of technologies and experts who are um, uh, not very happy about guardrails or policy enforcement yeah. on, on that matter. So, um, and you have always these people who say, uh, well, if you give me too many guardrails, I can't be innovative. And um, obviously, uh, it's selling something, selling a value add for them. And we always convince our users um, that this is the best solution. If you don't think it's the best solution, then don't go with us. So right. we don't force you to go with us. Um, it's your choice and people uh, get so many good services, so many advices, they're never left alone. So we force them into having success actually. We take their hand in onboarding and we never yeah. let, let lose their hand <coughs> until they're productive. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's always a good approach, right? Don't, don't force your customer in. Yeah. Make them want to use your stuff. Make yeah. them want to stay. Show um, them why it has value. Exactly. It's not even a, a force function no. at that point. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And that's how, if you do that 20 times, you have 20 happy customer teams yep. and you ha have ba you basically created a community. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. and we have so, so few tickets um, in, the, in the service center, like first level tickets or um, that sort of thing, because the people solve their problems uh, wow. within or between the project teams. That's amazing. So no tickets, you embrace the silos, you recruit the best people. Community obviously really matters to you. It's something that you're passionate a lot, about. A lot. Talk to me a little bit more about both your internal community as well as the broader Audi community. I'm sure a lot of people here driving Audis. I know John drives an Audi. We've got a whole family of Audi fans in the house here. What, is, what does that mean to you as a leader as well as the company? Um, the community in the cloud native uh, sense uh, obviously is a very different kind of community as in the Audi customer yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> I figured they well, I mean a little bit of overlap maybe, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an overlap. We have uh, customer success managers, for example, um, from other companies that are huge Audi fans and even have are leading an Audi fan club. So actually that was, yes. that was super fun when I was talking to our container security customer success manager. Um, from the company that is working with us in there. And he, he's actually, like literally leading an Audi fan club. Uh, and, and that's always, always. Does that make you feel good? Uh, it's it's uh, an honor for us, obviously, if our products um, are loved by, by the customers. So um, in IT infrastructure, you're very abstract, basically. It's a, it's a very abstract topic. So, um, Many people are really not uh, getting what we're doing, mm -hmm. so um, I needed like ten years to explain my friends what I'm actually doing. 
and I'm still <laughs> not sure. They ask me every year, you know. Yeah. I'm still not sure if it's uh, it stuck with them, but um, I tell the digital world needs compute, right? So mm -hmm. you need computing power somewhere, and we allocate that stuff. That's it. That's our thing. We allocate compute to where it's needed. And that usually that automatically... That doesn't take 10 years to explain. That, that, was, <laughs> it that doesn't, was legit. It doesn't, but, but the next 10 questions do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and obviously uh, in, the, in the Audis, we're talking driving data centers now. Mm -hmm. They are driving data centers. We create petabytes of they data are. every day with our fleet. We have autonomous driving, so a lot of GPU necessities, um, camera workloads. Um, we have a digital service portfolio that we want to engineer as amazing as our hardware products, as the cars itself. And we're coming from three to five year product cycles. You, you can't imagine in software that that's, it doesn't match. Right, there's a so, lot going on there. Um, yeah. And that's something we want to match uh, with our digital transformation. We need to go away from these old school product cycles, from these waterfall engineering, uh, to a continuous deployment and continuous development. And we're doing that obviously on Kubernetes with the many, many, many uh, development teams that we have in Audi and in the Volkswagen Group. And thus, the, the growing adaption of cloud native in general and this huge community, this is the biggest conference now, the biggest open source conference now in Europe. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, that's really amazing, yeah. yeah. And, and that creates obviously more overlap because people know now what cloud native is about. People know what kind of thing we're doing and they also um, recognized our contribution to CO2 uh, savings. Yes, for example, because we create in the cloud, we create like the the public transport uh, versus individual mobility uh, use case. Love because that. you share a data center with many companies. Yeah, you don't need the hardware yourself. Uh, like everybody has a laptop at home. Right. How often are you using your computer at home? Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. We're and all edge devices at this point. Same. Yeah. Sa same. Yeah. yeah. So. And if you share that computing power, if you share the chips, we could save so much, actually, in resources, in hardware, uh, that it All contributes to, to a higher goal. And, and that's what we're doing, not only this community, mm -hmm. but also um, in a transformational sense, in reaching our business goals, creating value add, having a better time to market. Cloud native community, everybody's asked that, uh, everybody uh, investing in cloud native, his main goal is kind of go rockets launching the time to market KPI here. I mean, time to market is really everyone's biggest KPI, I feel like, around exactly. here. Exactly. Last question for you, Sebastian, before we wrap up. Real quick, this is obviously a show that matters to you. You're a big Kubernetes user as well as, I mean, you sit on the CTO board here for CNCF. Very exciting. What are you most pumped about this week? Um, the CTO summit tomorrow, obviously, uh, we're talking about fin FinOps, financial operations, um, optimizing costs in the cloud. This is a topic everybody's oh God, very, huge very much huge into. topic right yes, now. Exactly. Yes, all about that cost optimization. In the last couple of years, everybody, I, I politically correct, say, um, created cloud uh, cost agnostic infrastructure. So they di didn't care what, what it was about, at least it boosts time to market. You know, that was the main KPI. And now we're optimizing all of that stuff and going into a more responsible uh, handling uh, costs and optimizing costs in the cloud. But um, what I'm really looking forward uh, here is meeting the people again. Mm -hmm. The communities that what creates the technologies. You have seen uh, 200K contributors yeah, um, it's a lot. 1,300 maintainers. It's and uh, talking to these people, exchanging with these people um, that really are hands on on these technologies and talking about um, exchanging like my needs, uh, my pain points. Uh, for example, certification processes in big companies and uh, cert managers and that sort of stuff and automate that in a, in a suitable way is like a very small pain point, but it's something people here are working on. So I will meet them, I will talk to them. Um, I hope uh, I, I get them today and we can exchange on yeah. how we develop the future 
of our digital world. And we are the foundation of the digital world. We allocate the computing power. Casual. So if quantum computing comes, we allocate a lot of computing power. Yeah, We're yeah. still there, <laughs> you know? An order of yeah. magnitude. <laughs> yes, oh, I love it. Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been really great. You, this is going to be a ride all day. Oh, yeah. And for you folks at home, thank you for tuning in. If you're here with us in Amsterdam, definitely check out the e-tron and say hello to Sebastian. He is here to meet you, as are we on the Cube with you. I'm Savannah Peterson. You're watching the Cube, the leading source in high-tech coverage here in Amsterdam at KubeCon.